Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to be open for whatever questions you may have, but we want to start today with Dermot Shea talking about the homicide last night in the 122 precinct. Good afternoon, everyone. So yesterday evening at about 9.17 p.m. in the confines of the 122nd Precinct at 25 Hilltop Terrace, we have a uh, Francisco, otherwise known as Frank Cali, exits his residence. Mr. Cali is widely reported to be associated on uh, the Internet and uh, newspapers and prior writings to be associated with organized crime. He exits his residence has a conversation with an individual where approximately 12 shots are fired with at least six striking the victim causing his demise. Needless to say, with the uh, potential organized crime angle to this story, it gets the utmost importance to the NYPD and the entire Detective Bureau. At the scene last night were members of Staten Island Homicide, 122 Squad, members of the Criminal Enterprise Division, as well as our federal counterparts with the FBI. It remains a very active homicide investigation at this point. I think it's a little preliminary to be making judgments on motive, but certainly uh, Mr. Cali's prior dealings, he has been uh, arrested prior by the feds, are a focal point at this point of the investigation, but nothing is being ruled out. I'll take some questions on this point. Miles? Sure. Well, well, not only in this investigation, but in any investigation. We have the luxury. Um, we're in a very good place from an investigative point of view in 2019 compared to just a few years ago. Uh, I've publicly praised the work Jesse Tisch has done many times. Um, license plate readers, the work our lab does, the video camera canvases, uh, the facial recognition tech, uh, technology, all of this builds a stronger case. All of this leads to where we are today in New York City. Uh, we, we are out there as we speak, as you know. Um, we have executed a warrant at that residence. We have uh, obtained video surveillance from that scene. We're uh, piecing together witness canvases, uh, extended video canvases. Um, there is reports of a car pulling away. That is accurate. Uh, that's not to make, again, it's a little preliminary to say that car is definitively tied to anything or that that's the only car or that there weren't additional people on foot. So this is a very early stage of this investigation, uh, and we have a lot of work to do. Could you talk a little bit about um, especially where it was done outside his home, who was home if his family was home, and also given like the previous mob boss crime family that it's usually done away from their home, how this is different than some of the historical other hits? So, so what I will say is uh, Mr. Cowley was home at his residence. Again, it was shortly after 9 p.m. Uh, our understanding is that he was home uh, with his members of his family. I won't go into individual members. He exits his house. Uh, there's a conversation, and it's a little preliminary, and there is uh, video accounts of what took place. I won't get too deep into it. But um, whether it was an altercation or a conversation, that remains to be seen. But he has a conversation with an individual in front of that residence, and that individual at some point in time, it's only about a minute into it, uh, pulls out a firearm and shots are fired. Even if it was a man or a woman in the car was seen. It appears to be a man, and this is very preliminary, uh, approximately 25 to 40 years of age. That's, that's all part of the investigation, um, and, and it's a little preliminary to have definitive answers for you at this time. Um, he walks out of his house. Um, what prompted him is part of what we're trying to discern now. Uh, whether he had uh, prior knowledge that somebody would be out there, did he expect somebody to be out there. Uh, we know that there was a vehicle accident in front of the residence. We believe that the victim's car was struck, uh, and that's part of the investigation as we move forward. Rocco? I'm sorry, Rocco first, and then. What was the accident? Are you suggesting it was an accident staged to get him out of the house? It, it, it appears, uh, with what we know at this point in time, that that was part of, uh, quite possible that that was part of a plan. That thing was an outside as opposed to someone going in there? Not definitive at this point, but he certainly, 
is involved, his car is involved in an accident with the individual that winds up shooting him. His so car, that's, car parked, his car is parked. That's not to say that he didn't know this person beforehand or not. So don't read too far into that. It's a little preliminary. To be determined, Rocco. Um, you know, at night, video, witness statements, we're tr still trying to narrow down. We do have a pickup truck that flees the scene, and we're very interested with that pickup truck, and we'll be putting out some photos of that uh, as soon as we get good information to with, put out. With damage, that pickup truck? We know that there will be damage. Um, how much? How much visible? We have a, uh, the victim's car, which sustained damage. Uh, we have a pickup truck that backed up into it. Uh, you can see on video that that uh, car belonging to the victim rocks significantly, so it took some force to do that. Whether there's visible damage to the car that pulled away remains to be seen, but it's quite possible. Although there is a, uh, it's a pickup truck, so there's a tow hitch. There may not be a lot of damage. You Tony? You talked about uh, Mr. Kelly's uh, uh, connections to organized crime have been reported in court and out of court. Uh, are you looking into or liaising with any law enforcement people overseas in terms of <coughs> any possible connections that he may have had that may throw light into on this subject? What was the last part, overseas and then overseas what? Overseas that may throw a light, you know, some light into what happened. Right? Sure. So uh, I was a little broad in the opening there. What It's been widely reported, as I said, his connections. Um, <coughs> but this is preliminary, and I think it would be a little uh, – Er, erring on our part to make any judgments. Um, certainly we're exploring what, what uh, his prior life or current life has connections to the incident last night. It also could have nothing to do with it. So we are at a very preliminary stage. Uh, we are ruling nothing out at this part. We are working very closely with our federal counterparts that we work with every day, quite frankly, as well as our criminal enterprise division and our local homicide squads. Just a couple more. You mentioned hold, hold on, and I'll get back to you. I believe that I believe that to be inaccurate at this time. Uh, what I believe happened was uh, Mr. Cowley was struck several times by gunfire in trying to elude additional gunfire, uh, fled to the rear area of his private vehicle, and somebody probably thought he was run over, but it was more that he was trying to get underneath the truck to elude gunfire. Yeah, his private vehicle you're referring to? I, I believe that was a, uh, a Cadillac SUV, um, but I will, f I will firm that up that it was parked out in front of his residence uh, that was struck by the pickup truck. And is his family and his associates, uh, whatever they may be, cooperating with the investigation? Uh, no comment on that. Chief, broadly speaking, when someone gets out in organized crime, there's always a concern about what that might mean. Yep. If you got him So, so what I will say is there has been a, um, and we were speaking about this earlier, there's been a, s several incidents, uh, whether you want to go back three months, six months, nine months, that, that being one of them. Um, we, we had an arrest just yesterday in New York City uh, from a 6-1 precinct, earlier homicide. Uh, we had the c case in the Bronx earlier this year in the uh, 44th precinct, the shooting at the McDonald's. There's been a number of uh, not a lot, but a couple incidents. Uh, I, w I would categorize it as more than we generally have seen in the last couple of years, and all of this will be part of the investigation going forward. What if any of these incidents are their connections or not? And it would be too preliminary to say that they are. In the back. Yeah, I, I would just like to emphasize that uh, you know. When you, when you look at the NYPD as a whole, this is what we do every day. We analyze any incident, whether it has a nexus to domestic violence, to drugs, potentially organized crime. Um, stopping future violence is what we do day in and day out with the deployment of resources, with Chief Monaghan, with all the resources that he has under him. Uh, I'm very confident that we can, uh, if there are chances for future violence between our partners, us, we will make sure that there is a, you know, kept to a minimum, if you will. In terms of the, the person who was doing the shooting, you described
describe him as a male, uh, 25 to 30. Uh, anything more indicating uh, identity, race, uh, ethnic status? We'll have more to come shortly. Let's just get a little. Uh, we're about probably 14, 15 hours into this as we expand the canvas. Okay, one more, and then we'll move on. Yeah. Yeah, we have, uh, I believe, uh, 12 shell casings recovered at the scene, and, and uh, I believe it is from a 9-millimeter handgun. Last one. Um, with the video you did recover, does it show the actual shooting, and does it show, was it clear enough to identify the shooter himself from the yeah, video? I, I won't get into um, what we can identify or what we can't. You see an altercation. Uh, where shots are fired, what appears to be shots, muzzle flash coming from one individual to the other. Captures the shooting. All right, let's move on to any other topics you may have. Something else. All right, Marv's well, first one up. Uh, can you uh, just the uh, reaction to the department on the stop and frisk uh, report? Sure. So uh, clearly the court ruled against us in terms of the, the squibs. Right? Is that what you're talking about, Miles? Oh, the ACLU. So let me back up then. Yeah, let me let me back up. So uh, I haven't read the report completely. Uh, we've seen the summary. Um, the stop and frisk, as you all know, we've been dealing with this now uh, since 2014 uh, when we began working with the monitor to roll out uh, uh, the remedial measures that they put into place. And so that's all still ongoing. Stop and frisk is, I would remind everyone, and, and uh, just for clarification, because folks, when they talk about stop and frisk, or as we, as we tend to, re we prefer to refer to it as investigative encounters, um, it really is uh, a tool that, um, that we have that was provided by the Supreme Court back in, in 1968, under that case, Terry versus Ohio. And so uh, that tool is still um, uh, available to our officers. We expect our officers to, to use stop and frisk. Uh, and so that's just one point I wanted to make. But the second thing I would point I would make is, is when we talk about the, the report and some of the, what they summarize in there um, is that, and you know this already, uh, stop and frisk uh, we peaked in, in 2011 at about just about 684,000 stops. Uh, last year we ended with under 10,000, just over 10,000 stops. And so when you, when you think about that, I mean, it's, it's more, you know, 94, 95 percent decrease is pretty significant. Um, the, the report is, I think, um, and some of the issues it raises uh, about the, the challenges that we face uh, in their view with respect to the numbers, um, again, they're, they're relatively low and we're doing a great job. The other thing I would add with respect to how our officers use stop and frisk, we have a number of mechanisms in place, and this is above and in addition to the remedial measures that the court has required, but we also monitor um, the officer's uh, activity. Uh, we monitor the way that they, um, when they use stop and frisk, uh, their, their, their immediate supervisors have to review those, uh, those stops. Um, on a monthly basis now through our Risk Management Bureau, we pay a lot of attention to meeting with borough commanders on a regular basis to remind them of the, the importance of keeping track of looking, uh, looking at body-worn camera video uh, and, and scrutinizing that video, particularly in cases of stops. There is also a pilot that's being conducted that you, I think you're aware of uh, that the, the federal monitor is conducting to look further at, at, stop, at stop and frisk as well and to sort of get a sense of what those stops look like and, and whether or not those stops are being reported because that seems to be the, the gist of um, and, the, and the focal point of, of the report, that is, that, that there is underreporting of stops. We monitor uh, and have determined that there are some, um, uh, some underreporting. Uh, that's not a surprise necessarily, but I wouldn't ever classify it as being anything close to systemic uh, as we, as we, um, as, uh, based on our review, uh, regular reviews. Yep, so, so earlier this week, uh, members of the Detective Bureau were at a location within the confines of the 102nd Precinct. Uh, the genesis of uh, them getting there was essentially a woman coming forward to us and reporting uh, that a, a little over 40 years ago, she recalls now um, that a little over 40 years ago, she was present at this house and, and uh, gave us information regarding the presence of a body that was buried within plastic bags in the backyard. 
uh, members of the uh, 102 squad, Queen South Homicide, responded um, with a cadaver dog, which positively hit on the area. Uh, the ensuing search disclosed that uh, exactly where she recalled that the, the remains would be, we in fact did remain what we believe to be uh, human remains. Um, very active, very uh, preliminary regard to this case. Um, the, the murder allegedly took place at a location um, possibly connected to a barbershop in Queens that we have not yet been able to locate, but this inv investigation remains very active. This has not been ruled a homicide as of yet. We did have a uh, OCME anthropologist on the scene. What we do know is that uh, we have a woman reporting that a homicide took place. Uh, the details are not all filled in, as you can imagine, over 40 years ago. The occupants of the current house are not connected to who was there at that time. Um, but we do have partial remains, bones, if you will, and, and we believe they are human remains. Did she provide any other context or tips or information? Like, did she witness the homicide or was it just as her responding to it? She, she did provide some uh, other information, and that remains part of the investigation that's moving forward. We have. Uh, we have a lot of work to do on this case, as you can imagine. We have not been able to uh, locate an individual as of yet that reported missing, whether it's male or female. There is a lot of work to do in this case at this point. Did she explain did something jog her memory? I mean, four years later, it's been a long time. Did she kind of give the background on why in 2019 or, or just was it like a repressed memory? It, it was more of the repressed memory as, as, as it was relayed. Yep. Uh, did the anthropologists say whether they were uh, able to say whether they were uh, female or give an approximate age uh, on the remains? We're not there yet, Tony, uh, and we do not have a complete skeleton, uh, but we do believe we have human remains. And, and uh, in all likelihood, there's a strong possibility that this will turn into a homicide declaration. In the back? Well, that there's, there's, there's uh, a multitude of tracks that will all converge. We have the OCME playing a significant role in a case like this. The anthropologist, as I said, on the scene that is declaring to us, yes, these are in fact human remains. We have a number of jobs that takes place in New York City where it, it will turn out to be a, a pet buried in the backyard. Uh, the OCME now will jump in and determine, can we determine from what we have, and, and this is challenging at times, whether the bones that we now know are human, what caused death? Is there impacts from an ax, things of that nature? Are there gunshots? So there's a lot of work on the forensic side. I can tell you significantly on the detective side, we've already interviewed a number of people. Detectives have already flown out of state on this case. There's a lot of work going on, but this will be uh, a challenging case to make, as you can imagine, 40 some odd years. Rocco? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Sure. So um, I'll start with the uh, that terrible incident from the hotel. I believe that was in December. I think uh, that was a fairly newsworthy case when uh, two women in the hotel in Manhattan with the baby in the stroller and that tragedy. Uh, I, I do expect an arrest to be made in that case. Um, when that case uh, occurred, we had a situation where two individuals took a bus to Manhattan from, uh, I believe, Delaware. Uh, at some point during their stay at that hotel, we, we discovered that the baby had passed away in that tragedy. There were some narcotics recovered at the time, uh, heroin, as I can recall, and, and a significant amount. Um, with this uh, declaration of the homicide, I would expect uh, there will be charges filed. But there's some work to do here, Rocco. Um, what those charges will be, we, we do have some work to do, do uh, working together with the Manhattan DA's office to determine, now that we know uh, the homicide, where did it in fact occur and what can we prove in terms of charges. But I would expect an arrest. With the Staten Island case, uh, this was the case from January. As you can recall, there was a, uh, a woman that was beaten. Uh, an arrest was made on that case. Around the same time, we had a, uh, a uh, 
a woman that was discovered deceased in a house. We knew from the start that we believed the man that we had uh, arrested for the first incident was responsible. Um, he is currently incarcerated on the first charge. We believe we have a good, strong case, and we would expect charges uh, forthcoming uh, with the Staten Island DA and our detectives. What's the motive? Uh, I will say that he, uh, in the second incident, actually, so the first one I referred to where he was arrested, uh, that was a beating on the street, and there was a se potential sex angle to that, and I would not rule that out. This is an individual, lengthy record, on parole, um, and, and it was uh, really some good work getting him off the street quick. What do you mean by sex? In terms of not only was it um, in terms of hitting her on the street, we believe his intention was to commit a sex act. And do you know the cause of death in the second incident? I would have to get back to you on that. Yeah, Miles, I could be wrong, but I don't think that's factually accurate. My recollection is this is an individual that had, um, and again, I could be wrong, my, from well, going back about two, three months. The, label, the job was labeled closed uh, by the precinct. Uh, that allowed him to we get back to that. Yeah, yeah. I think we were looking for that individual for some time. I'm very glad you asked that question there, Rocco. <laughs> again, our Internal Affairs Unit conducted an investigation based on these rumors. And I'm going to say it again, rumors that were going around in Brooklyn North. They did their investigation, and they found these claims, as of this time, to be completely and absolutely unfounded. Remarkably, though, I've read stories in the press that claims to have multiple sources offering specific details about this incident all of which was supposedly on a body-worn camera. We reviewed the body-worn cameras in the 7-5, and we find nothing. We look into this allegation, and we've determined zero actual evidence that it occurred. We told members of the press yesterday that we had not substantiated this. We were just looking into it now, and we asked that uh, it probably wouldn't be prudent to report on it at this time based on no more than third-hand information or rumors. But that didn't stop the stories from being printed. Acting on that rumor mill that goes through the Brooklyn borough and the precincts, a sergeant and two police officers had their names attached to this false story. And that is extremely terrible for those people involved. This type of reporting does have consequences. Both the press and the police are held to high standards as they should be. I would ask people who are trusted to report the news to take a moment before submitting that story to make sure it is completely and totally vetted. I understand the rush to be first is something that comes with your job, but it can't come at the expense of facts. And also, let me say to the members of my department, to the members of the NYPD, that perpetrating rumors and gossip have real and total consequences and unintended damage. We have a responsibility to be accurate when we speak. And we need to take that responsibility serious. And that goes for every member of this agency, of the police department. When you spread rumors, it has consequences. We don't want spreading of gossip or misinformation, and definitely we don't want to be doing it at someone else's expense. Any questions in regard to that? Thank you for having me say clear? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> All right. Uh, it's a rumor. It started as a rumor and it grew on itself. And then it made it into the media, and as the media did it, it exploded. We have absolutely nothing to show that it happened. The rumor was, the rumor was that uh, on body cam video that there was a female officer and a sergeant in a command that recorded an illicit sex act. We have nothing, no body cam video, nothing. That's why we ask, take that step back. Don't rush to be the first one to report a story. Give us an opportunity to vet these stories for you. We will get back to you. 
We are very transparent. When we mess up, I'll stand up here right away and tell you we mess up. But give us a chance to vet these stories before you get it out there and put it out there. The 7 5 Command, command that's doing great in crime, that does great work every day, is now circulating with all these rumors that are false. All right, thank you. Thank you.